Hi, everybody. Uh, it is actually 11 a.m. in Houston, 11 a.m. in San Antonio, where uh, we're having the uh, tandem meeting, actually. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you joining us uh, today for this uh, very special ICH webinar uh, dedicated to heme pathology. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris, and it is my great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce today our guest and distinguished uh, uh, speaker, uh, namely uh, Dr. Sanam uh, Logavi. And this uh, uh, webinar is broadcasted to you live from Texas, actually, guys. So we are uh, with Sanam uh, on the same, in the same uh, time zone. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Sanam Logavi uh, is an associate professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, in Houston. And she is really a very, very big and top expert in the field of heme pathology. She has a, a great uh, passion uh, for teaching, for education, and you may have seen in the last few years that she has been leading a lot of initiatives, including uh, some uh, pathology uh, teaching and dissemination uh, as part of the American Society of Hematology educational activities. And we're very fortunate that she uh, accepted uh, to deliver this special webinar uh, for us today at the IACH where you will be amazed by the content. Uh, she will go uh, through some basics which are crucial for all of us in the clinical hematology field, because I kindly remind uh, all of us that having new drugs is great. Making revolutionary cellular therapies is definitely amazing, but the founding principle of practicing oncology and treating blood cancers is actually about pathology. Without pathology, actually, you do, you're not even allowed to initiate a treatment. And th this is why we're very proud having uh, Dr. Logavi with us. So without any further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to you, uh, Sanam, and thank you again uh, for being with us. And it will be an interactive uh, session, uh, webinar. So please don't hesitate to post your questions, your suggestions to your comments. And Dr. Logavi will handle them at the end uh, of the webinar. In the meantime, I personally will have to leave you because then I have my talk at Tandem uh, in a few minutes. But you will be in good hands with Dr. Logavi. So now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Moti, for the kind introduction that, you know, everything you said makes me so happy to hear, you know, how you value pathology. I'm very, very appreciative and grateful to be here today. I thank the audience for tuning into this webinar. And really, I thank you and the IACH team for giving me this opportunity. Um, what I really hope to, you know, get across today, even though the title of my talk is Pathology Made Easy, I think you know, you'll agree with me that there's really nothing easy about pathology, but I hope to you know, convey to you how we can take a, a, a subject that is complex and by systematically approaching it and methodotic, you know, going through a methodology that's consistent and systematic, we can actually make a diagnosis that can help a patient in their journey. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'm gonna share my slides. And, um, and you are the right person to tell us. <laughs> Thank you. All thank about you. this. All right. So I'm going to start by saying, you know, my first disclosure is that I can't tell you all the tricks in one hour. And also, I'm not going to tell you all the tricks because I would like to keep my job. Uh, but, you know, the, the reality is that I think pathology is complex, right? I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that as a trainee, it, it took me about three years to tell malignant from benign. Um, you know, just, just to be able to tell malignant cells from benign. And I think it's it's a process. It You know, they tell you in training, it, te it tells you, it takes you about three years to form the correct synapses in your brain to be able to 
apply your knowledge to practice. And I think that's very much true. Something happens during the third year of your training where everything starts to make sense. And you know, I hope to share that knowledge with you today. So during this talk, I'm gonna focus on bone marrow pathology, normal bone marrow pathology at first, and then I'll use AML as an example or acute myeloid leukemia as an example to show you how we apply this multidisciplinary and multifaceted approach uh, to diagnosis and hematopathology. Uh, so during the talk, I'll review a little bit of basics about the ancillary methods and testings that we use in pathology, namely flow cytometry, cytogenetics, uh, molecular diagnostics, and then I'll review a little bit the, the revised and new classification of AML and how we can apply the morphology of these different diseases to arrive at a conclusive diagnosis. And I'll show you some case examples that, you know, and the challenges that we face every day in applying these, uh, these, this knowledge and these criteria into classifying disease. So I'll first start with, you know, the different sample types. When you think about a patient that's undergoing a bone marrow biopsy, the, the sample types that we receive are peripheral blood, uh, a bone marrow aspirate, hopefully, if the, you know, if it wasn't a dried tap. And then the bone marrow clot is the, the spin down of the bone marrow aspirate, and obviously the bone marrow trephine or core biopsy. So on the peripheral blood, we're able to assess for dysplasia. We're able to assess for the presence or absence of blasts. We can tell, you know, the morphology of lymphocytes, different, uh, um, you know, white cells, whether they're circulating nucleated red blood cells, and all of these are clues to underlying pathologies. We are able to do flow cytometry, cytochemical testing, karyotype, fish, and molecular testing on peripheral blood, with some exceptions. But you know, in the majority of the cases, if you're unable to get a good aspirate, we're, we're pretty much able to use the peripheral blood as a surrogate and use that as a sample. The bone marrow aspirate is really one of the most helpful and most useful uh, samples for us because first of all, it's a fresh specimen. It's not fixed in formalin. So we can do a lot of our ancillary testings on this. And the, the uh, morphology of the different cellular components of the bone marrow is best appreciated on the bone marrow aspirate. So we can see a lot of details on the bone marrow aspirate that we're unable to appreciate in the core biopsy and in the clot section. That being said, the core biopsy and the clot section are also very useful, particularly when you want to look at the architecture of certain features. Let's say if I wanna look at the, uh, the distribution of megakaryocytes, where they're located, whether there's clustering or not, the biopsy is more helpful than the aspirate. You know, if I'm looking for, for paratrabecular lymphoid aggregates um, in a patient that has a suspected diagnosis of follicular lymphoma, the bone marrow core biopsy is a more um, useful specimen. And obviously the most helpful thing, or you know, the most valuable feature of the bone marrow biopsy or uh, clot section is that we can do immunohistochemical stains on it. And that's very helpful for making a diagnosis as well. All right, so nothing good comes out of an inadequate sample. So the most important thing for us is that the bone marrow aspirate and core biopsy are actually adequate. But how do we judge that? So a bone marrow aspirate in minimum should have about three particles per slide. And at our center, we do you know 12 slides. We make 12 slides of the aspirate, but we only stain four of them and keep some for you know if, if we need additional studies. And then you can do an iron stain on the bone marrow aspirate, but obviously you have to have good representation of bone marrow and you have to have nucleated red cells for the iron stain to be good if you're evaluating for ring sideroblasts and obviously for storage iron you want to see the particles otherwise the, the iron stain is not useful um and then you know we uh, we also use the aspirate for additional ancillary studies that may have not been ordered on the bone marrow uh you know if we see something suspicious so you you also want to be mindful of how you collect these samples so, you know, cytogenetics can use a heparin, uh, and a green top tube with a heparin anticoagulant. The molecular laboratory tends to use an EDTA or a purple top because, as you know, heparin can interfere with some PCR studies. So, you know, you want to be mindful of how you collect these samples as well. So this is an example of a good aspirate. See how many particles there are. The white holes are the fat and the purple blobs are the, the particles. It's great. This is a good, adequate specimen. 
And here's, you know, on higher power, again, an optimal aspirate smear where you see different cells, you see the nucleated red blood cells here, I'm going to point at them for you, the different myeloid cells and the different stages of maturation. Here's a megakaryocyte here. This is great. On the other hand, this is an inadequate aspirate smear. So look at this. This almost looks like peripheral blood. There's only a nucleated red blood cells, a few white cells here and there, and this does not count as a spicule here. This is just junk. Okay, how about the biopsy? The bone marrow core biopsy, you know, ideally you want to get a three centimeter length, but that never happens. So, you know, that, that's in an imaginary world. If we get something that's about one and a half centimeters, we're happy. Uh, best to perform the biopsy actually prior to the aspirate to avoid aspiration artifact. However, I recognize and I acknowledge that in, you know, a lot of uh, practices, the aspirate is done first. And then, uh, you know, the, the touch, uh, the core biopsy is great to get a touch imprint, particularly if you have a dry tap. So remember that you can always get a touch imprint of the core biopsy, and we can appreciate the same cellular details on the touch imprint if you're unable to get a good um, aspirate. And then we can also use the touch for cytochemical stains or fish and everything that we can do on the aspirate smear. But remember, the core biopsy is a decalcified specimen. We have to decalcify the bone in order to be able to cut the block. So there are limitations to the ancillary studies that we can do on the core biopsy. Let's say we can't just send the core biopsy for NGS, right? Okay, so here are examples of adequate versus inadequate. So the left-hand side is a perfect adequate biopsy. It's intact, it's long enough. The other ones are inadequate and it's not just about size. If you measure these, these are probably adequate in length. But on this one, it's mostly blood with a little bit of bone marrow. And then the other one is essentially just periosteum. So it does, there's no marrow space available for evaluation. All right, so how about bone marrow cellularity? You see these in all of our reports, and this is a very important feature in assessing for bone marrow pathology. Normal bone marrow cellularity is the patient's age, uh, sorry, 100 minus the patient, patient's age plus or minus 10. So let's say if I am 45 years old, my bo normal bone marrow cellularity is somewhere around 55 to 65. And um, so the, and that ratio 55 to 65% is the, the ratio of hematopoietic elements to the fat. So here the, you know, the pink and the purple are the hematopoietic elements and the, the white holes are the fat. Uh, and as we age, the cellularity decreases. So in a newborn, the cellularity is close to 100% with very little fat. And in a 90-year-old, there's about 90% fat. Okay, so by examining what's normal, we can recognize what's abnormal. So we have to be able to recognize normal in order to, to be able to identify abnormal, right? Okay, so let's look at some of these bone marrow lineages. The granulocytic lineage is the predominant lineage in any normal bone marrow. It's about 50 to 70% of the cells. It starts from the myeloblast and they mature all the way down to the neutrophil or the eosinophil or the basophil. Um, and promyelocytes, you know, there is a, uh, there's a method to this madness. So if you look, the promyelocytes, these cells that I'm pointing to here, uh, and the, uh, the blasts are supposed to be close to the bony trabeculae. And then as they mature, they move into the intermedullary space and the space that's, you know, uh, farther from the bone. And if you do a myeloproxidase IHC on a bone marrow core biopsy, you can see these MPO positive cells really aggregating around the bony trabeculae. The other thing I want to point out is that, you know, we talk about diversity in the workplace and how good it is. You know where else diversity is good? In the bone marrow. You have to have a diverse population of cells. If you see a monotonous population of cells, that is bad. That's usually a sign of neoplasia, that a cell is taking over the other cellular components. And you know, all of these cells have actually a skill set and a function that's necessary. So you need all of them to have a healthy, happy bone marrow. Um, I want to point out the promyelocyte morphology in, you know, specific, because I think, that, you know, as a hematologist for you, this is probably the most important diagnosis to make. So this is a normal promyelocyte on the left-hand side. You can see it has some cytoplasm. It has a large nucleus. It has this perinuclear clearing. If you see here, there's a little bit of a space that we call the Hoth. And the cytoplasm is highly granular. 
On the other hand, the promyelocyte in, in acute promyelocytic leukemia looks very different, right? First of all, it loses that normal uh, perinuclear half, and then these granules form actual hour rods. So the granules are stuck together and form the hour rods. And you know, this is what we call a, a faggot cell that is filled with these hour rods. All right, let's look at some other myeloid lineages. So this is an eosinophil. Um, here's a basophil. This is a mast cell. You know, as trainees, I get a lot of questions uh, from trainees on how to differentiate a mast cell from a basophil. They both have basophilic granules. If you pay attention to the basophil, the basophil, you can still see the nucleus and the granules are very coarse. Whereas in a normal mast cell, the granules actually cover the entire nucleus. It's very difficult to see the nucleus and the granules are finer, they're smaller, but they're, you know, equally purple. And then here are a few, you know, a couple monocytes that look a little bit reactive. Um, their, their cytoplasm is more blue than you normally see in monocytes, but they're a little bit reactive and, and immature looking. So monocytes. Um, all right, so let's move on to the erythroid lineage. Um, the erythroid lineage on the core biopsy is not, you know, it's not very, um, it, the core biopsy is not designed to assess for erythroid dysplasia, but you can see, you know, certain features. One is that erythroid cells are in islands. They like, you know, they're very social, like to be together. So normal erythroid cells are distributed in islands, and these are mature cells. You see them, they look like, they look very dark, the nuclei are very dark, and they all look like they have a space around them. On the other hand, immature erythroids, or, you know, very uh, erythroid blasts or very early erythroids, they look, they have a much finer chromatin, but the clue to diagnose these or, you know, identify these is this kind of pink long nucleolus that they have that often touches the nuclear membrane and they may be multiple. So look at this, look at this. These are actually the nucleoli. So these are immature erythroid islands. Same as, you know, the granule sites, you want to see diversity in the, in the maturation pattern of erythroids. So they start from the erythroblast. It's very blue, very round nucleus, um, and, you know, uh, a high NC ratio. And then as they mature, the, the cytoplasm acquires hemoglobin, so it becomes pinker. The nucleus starts to shrink. And at the very late stage, the nucleus is expelled, and you're left with a mature RBC that doesn't have a nucleus. I just wanted to show you an example of a nurse cell. You'll see this in the literature. Sometimes you see it in presentations. Uh, the reason we call this a nurse cell is that it is, um, the, the nurse cells are histiocytes, right? So they are CD163 positive and erythrocytes have CD163 ligand. So they tend to, they tend to, you know, populate around these cells. And the reason they're called histiocytes is that we think that, you know, these histiocytes are actually nursing the cells. So what about, you know, we, we learned about what normal erythroids are supposed to look like. What about dysplasia? Erythroid dysplasia comes in many flavors, right? And I'm showing you some examples here. Uh, first of all, you know, if you look hard enough in any person's bone marrow, you're going to see a few dysplastic or dyspoetic erythroid cells. That's why we try to enforce the 10% threshold to say that there is a, um, you know, bona fide dysplasia in, in the erythroid lineage. But here are some examples. So if you see nuclear fragments, right, that's an example of dysplasia. If you see nuclear budding, like this one here, normal erythroids tend to have very round, punched out nuclei. So this budding is abnormal. If you see pycnosis, little nuclear remnants in something that should otherwise not have a nucleus is abnormal. Multinucleation, this erythroid almost looks like a megakaryocyte. Me megakaryocyte, it's huge and the nucleus is multilobated. That's very abnormal. But look at the other erythroids around it. These are abnormal and dysplastic too. And then cytoplasmic fraying, you know, it's just a fancy word for abnormal hemoglobinization. You can see around the, the cytoplasm is there, there are, you know, defects in the hemoglobinization. So that's cytoplasmic uh, fraying. And then basophilic stippling, I apologize, it's not very uh, obvious on the picture, but they're the little blue dots in the cytoplasm of the uh, of the erythroid cells, that's basophilic stippling, and then binucleation and megaloblastoid maturation is when the nucleus and cytoplasm are out of sync. All right, so megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes, obviously, they produce our platelets. Um, their um, megakaryocyte maturation is characterized by progressive nuclear lobulation. 
what is this the result of? It's really the result of endomitosis, where the DNA doubles without cell division. So you get the, these uh, lobulations in the uh, in the nucleus of the megakaryocyte. Normally, megakaryocytes uh, reside adjacent to the bone marrow sinuses. So here you can see a sinus, and you can see that the megakaryocyte is next to a sinus. Here's another sinus. The megakaryocyte is next to the sinus. They do not like to be close to the bony trabeculae. And in fact, if you see a lot of megakaryocytes close to the bony trabeculae, you should think of a myeloproliferative neoplasm, namely um, primary myelofibrosis. And then there is a there is a limit to the number of megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. So the, the ideal number is about three to six per high power field. If you see less than that, it's an indication of hypoplasia. If you see more than that, it's hyperplasia. And megakaryocytes like to be separated in the bone marrow, unlike the erythroid precursors. So the megakaryocytes kind of like are, you know, they love the COVID era. They love social distancing. They don't like to be clustered. If you see clustering of megakaryocytes, that's usually an indication of a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And let's look at some megakaryocyte morphology. So first of all, you know, there is a variation to normal. They're not all these huge multi-lobulated cells. Megakaryocyte, immature megakaryocytes, you know, young megakaryocytes tend to have less lobated nuclei and the NC ratio is high. But as they mature, they, they gain more cytoplasm, you know, obviously the platelets and the nucleus becomes multi-lobulated. Now, I want to point out to you that I took all of these pictures with the same microscope objective. So look at the megakaryocytes of essential thrombocythemia and polycythemia vera. First of all, they look different, right? ET has the biggest megakaryocytes. But look at them compared to normal. These are huge, right? On the other hand, MDS megakaryocytes, they tend to be smaller. So usually you have hypolobated small megakaryocytes and this separating of the nuclear lobes is a feature of megakaryocytic dysplasia. It's not 100% specific. You can see it in some reactive conditions like HIV. But if you see a lot of these, you want to think about uh, dysplasia as well. Okay, now that we learned about normal, let's talk a little bit about abnormal, right? So, and again, for the abnormal part of this talk, I'm going to focus on AML classification and how we apply this, this hematopathology knowledge to, to practice. Okay, so I want to remind you, you know, this is a really nice schematic that uh, one of my good friends and colleagues did for a paper, uh, you know, looking at drug approvals for AML uh, within the last few years. So we go from April 2007, and this, this paper was published in 2023, so it goes to December 2022. And if you look at these FDA approved agents, all of them essentially are based on molecular alterations that is present within you know, different subtypes of, so these are all targeted therapies that are based on the diagnosis that the hematopathologist or the molecular pathologist makes. So how do we do this? How do we make this diagnosis? You know, we talked about morphology uh, in, the, in the normal section of the, the talk. Obviously that's the cornerstone of making a right diagnosis because what you see on morphology really determines your downstream workup of the, of the sample. So it's still, for me, the most helpful feature is morphology. But obviously, you know, I cannot practice without aminophenotypic characterization. If you can, you know, I, I, I've been doing hematopathology for 10 years, but if you give me a, uh, you know, bone marrow sample now with a ton of glass, I can guess whether they're myeloid or, you know, lymphoid based on uh, morphology, but I have been wrong sometimes. So I think, you know, immunophenotypic character characterization is a must. Cytogenetics, obviously, you know, every bone marrow should get a carry type. It's, it's a must. And then we do fish and uh, optical genome mapping selectively. We don't do it for everything, but obviously very helpful for, you know, finding structural or copy number variations in the, in the chromosomes. And, you know, somatic mutations using next generation sequencing is obviously very, very important, particularly in, in myeloid neoplasia now, because nobody gets treated without knowledge of, of the mutations. But, you know, ancillary, so the ancillary studies need to be contributory. We don't just order everything on every marrow, right? They need to have a diagnostic purpose, a prognostic purpose, or a predictive value in, in, in you know, determining the patient's optimal therapy. And let's look and see how these, you know, can contribute. Okay, so we'll start with the very basics, immunohistochemistry. You know, immunohistochemistry is the, the oldest ancillary study that's available and out there. And here I'm just showing you a list of, uh, you know, stains. This is in no particular order or importance. 
It's just to tell you that we can use different stains to determine cell lineage and to look at the distribution of different cell lineages by morphology. And that's something that we can't do by flow cytometry, right? So, you know, we can tell different cell lineages based on antigen expression, right? Flow cytometry is really one of the most helpful, um, you know, ancillary studies we can do on a bone marrow uh, because in addition to being able to phenotype different cell populations, it's great for detecting small populations. And, you know, if you look at measurable residual disease detection, which is big in CLL, in AML, um, you know, in hairy cell leukemia and various forms of neoplasms, obviously in BALL and TALL, uh, this is all done by flow cytometry, you know, with the exception of some molecular markers, really the most applicable method to most of these neoplasms is flow cytometry for measurable residual disease. And the LOD or lower limit of detection for this assay is about 0.1%, which is 10 to the minus four. Where does that come from? It comes from the, the uh, denominator, right? So in order to be able to achieve this limit of detection, you need to be able to collect 200,000 cells, okay? And the reason that the 200,000 number is important is because we define a population as 20 events. So 20 over 200,000 is 0.1%, and that's how we achieve this limit of detection. But the sensitivity depends on the number of events you collect. So if you give me a very hypocellular bone marrow that has only 5,000 events, then the level of sensitivity that I can achieve is nowhere near this, right? So it depends. And also it depends on the, the sample being representative of bone marrow. So you can give me a peripheral blood sample and I can collect maybe 200,000 events, but if it's not representative of bone marrow, if you don't have enough precursors, then that doesn't count, right? So you need to, it needs to be both adequately cellular and it needs to have the, the optimal cellular composition. So, you know, we said we're gonna focus on myeloid neoplasia. So here I'm just showing you a snapshot of myeloid maturation and monocytic, but I wanna use this to point out that, you know, the bone marrow is an incredibly consistent organ and hematopoietic maturation is very reliable and consistent. So if you take, you know, in a healthy resting bone marrow, if you take my bone marrow and your bone marrow and, you know, the next 10 people's bone marrow, they're all pretty much gonna look the same unless there's some acute event going on. So it's very consistent. And that's why we can rely on deviations from normal to identify abnormal. But you know, let me tell you, these deviations from normal, they are not consistent, okay? So that's what makes our job a little bit harder. But again, you know, this, this is just here for your reference, but there is a very strict pattern of antigen expression in various stages of maturation in myeloid and monocytic cells. The karyotype. Karyotype is great. It gives us, a, you know, uh, it's still a very valuable uh, tool, but there are limitations to the karyotype. And that is, first of all, you need viable cells for a karyotype. You need the cells to be dividing. So there needs to be growth. If you have a very slow growing lymphoid neoplasm, you may get a normal karyotype where there's extensive involvement in the bone marrow, but that's just because the myeloid cells are outgrowing the lymphoma cells. So it is dependent on the growth of the neoplastic cells. And it takes time. It takes about 10 days to get a karyotype back normally. So it's not ideal, but you know, again, still it's part of the classification of myelodysplasia re related AML. You rely on these karyotypic abnormalities. I wanna tell you a little bit about fish. So, you know, you hear about fish a lot and you hear about fusion probes and break apart probes. What are these and, you know, how do we use them and how do we apply them? So the, the fusion probes are great for when you're looking for a fusion and you know both, both partners. That, you know, an example of that is BCR able. So if, you're, if you have suspected CML and you're looking for BCR able, fusion probe is great because you want to see the BCR fuse to the able signal. Whereas break apart probes are good for promiscuous genes like KMT2A, um, like MIC, where the partners can be various and we don't really care about, not that we don't care about, but it's not as important to identify the partner as to just say that there's a rearrangement of this gene. And so that's where we, we you know, use the break apart probe. We can tell here that there's a KMT2 rearrangement because the red and the green signal are separated, but I can't tell you what the partner is based on this. Okay, and then next generation sequencing, you know, this is going to be different depending on your institutions, 
But if we're talking about, you know, let's say a myeloid panel with a non-error corrected NGS, which means that we're not correcting for sequencing errors uh, and we're not sequencing with a very high depth, Normally, these panels have a sensitivity or a lower limit of detection of about 2% mutant DNA in the background of wild, uh, wild type. Again, the panels are pretty, you know, they can be different across institutions, but most myeloid panels include the relevant and pertinent genes that you need for disease classification and determining optimal therapy. Uh, you know, one thing I want to uh, point out here is that most hematologic panels do not have a germline control. So if you're, you know, if you think about the solid tumor world and uh, next generation sequencing that we do for solid tumors, we use peripheral blood as a germline control to filter out normal polymorphisms, you know, th these variations in, in our DNA, but we don't have that in the heme panels. And that's the reason you see a lot of variants of uncertain significance. You know, this is an example of our report where we, we try to say something is somatic based on you know, the knowledge base and the literature, based on the variant allele frequency of the mutation, if it's subheterozygous, but we're not 100% sure you know, they, because we're not using a germline control in essence. So if we see something that's rare, not reported in the literature, we're not sure if it's pathogenic or not, and it's present at around 50% variant allele frequency, we usually call that a VUS because we're not sure if it's pathogenic and we're not sure if it's coming from the germline DNA or from disease. So that's the reason you see some of those. Okay, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about, you know, we have this thing and you can read about this. This is, this is published in Blood Advanced or Journal of Molecular Diagnostics. So at, at our institution, we're very lucky. We have this ultra rapid reporting uh, system that we call ur urgency. And the reason we're able to report is so we, you know, we can report out on these 11 genes in about two days. And the reason we're able to do that is that we bypass the bidirectional sequencing and we sequence only in one direction, but it's only for hotspot mutations, really with the exception of TP53 on here, that's uh, you know, more extensive. It's really designed to detect hotspot mutations and the LOD for this assay is about 5%. But it's very helpful in making a diagnosis, you know, urgently when, when you need these genes. And the, the reason I'm circling these here is because they have these genes have immediate prognostic or predictive value in, in AML. Okay, so you know, let's let's talk a little bit about turnaround times and expectations. So this and, and you know, I'm talking about our lab. Obviously, this may be different at, at uh, various institutions. But I think you know it's reasonable to expect a bone marrow pathology report back within two to four, two to three days, right? Because remember, when you do the bone marrow biopsy on the first day, it needs to get processed. So when you do the bone marrow today, I don't actually see the slides until the next day. I only see the aspirate smear. So I can tell you what the blast percentage is, but I can't give you a full diagnosis until about you know a couple of days later. And then immunophenotyping, you know, we can do a really rapid preliminary scatter, just look for blasts. Uh, on the same day, but the full panel usually comes out the next day. Uh, at our center, we do fish for APL, so for PML, RARA, and for the core binding factor AMLs on all of our newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemias, and that is done on the same day. Uh, we do a karyotype that takes about three to eight days, again, depending on the growth of the cells. And then we have started doing optical genome mapping for all of our newly diagnosed AMLs, and that takes about 10 days. And I'll talk a little bit about optical genome mapping. And then molecular analysis, you know, every AML gets a FLT3. We do the NGS. I told you the rapid panel is done in about two days and reports on 11 genes. Our full panel that reports on 81 genes takes about three to five days. Uh, and then we also have a, now an RNA-based leukemia translocation panel also takes about four to seven days. Okay. So, you know, just to briefly remind you about the, the classification of acute myeloid leukemia. So this is the WHO, and I'll also show you the ICC. There's a lot of overlap. I don't want to go to, into a lot of detail on this, but just to show you that the classification is largely based on genetics. So you need to be able to detect these various genetic abnormalities in order to give the patient an accurate diagnosis, right? So this is the WHO and this is the ICC. Again, you know, there, there's a whole other lecture that we can do on the classification of AML. But again, you, you know, you need to have knowledge of these various uh, abnormalities to give, give a correct diagnosis.
And the ELN is, you know, largely in line with ICC, uses similar uh, genetic aberrations or alterations to classify AML into favorable, intermediate, and adverse risk disease. So again, and this, you know, obviously uh, has implications for therapy, whether the patient should get transplanted or not, you know, uh, whether, you know, what type of therapy they should get. So you need to have knowledge of these aberrations. Uh, I'm going to skip over this, actually. Uh, AML with myelodysplasia related, uh, you know, changes what, or what was used to be called uh, myelodysplasia related changes in the WHO 2016 has now also been refined a little bit to include these myelodysplasia defining mutations. In the ICC, we have RUNX1 and the WHO, it's all the other genes. So there's a lot of overlap with the addition of RUNX1 in the ICC. But again, you need to have knowledge of these mutations in order to be able to classify the disease correctly. So let's go through some cases and, you know, let me just tell you a lot of these, we can actually identify morphologically, right? So let me tell you which ones these are. So obviously the prototype and the best one being acute promyelocytic leukemia. If you show acute promyelocytic leukemia to any experienced somatopathologist, they can tell you with a very high likelihood whether this case is an APL or not. And so what do we use to do this? One is obviously the identification of multiple hour rods, right? That's that's a very good indication. The other one, and I think this is something that I use very, very frequently and I rely on it heavily, is that APL, even microgranular APL, where you may not see uh, the hour rods, is always uniformly and strongly positive for MPO. That's very important. Weak MPO is never APL, okay? And then by flow cytometry, the typical uh, phenotype of APL is obviously CD34 negative, HLA-DR negative, and 117 positive. And this is what you will see in the books and you may get tested on, but you know this is not constant. You may actually have CD34 positive APL, and that usually correlates with the microgranular variant. 821 or RUNX1, RUNX1, T1, we can also tell with, you know, with uh, fairly certainty. Uh, and that is because you know, these have these long single hour rods in the blasts. The maturing myeloid cells are often dysplastic and they have these pink colored salmon granules. And the other very helpful thing is that these blasts have upregulated B cell programs. And so they often express CD19, which is a B cell marker. Here's another example. So inversion 16 is something that we can tell with you know, good, uh, good confidence. And that's because these AMLs are typically monocytic and they have these abnormal eosinophilic uh, cells, which are you know, abnormal eosinophils. You still see the eosinophilic granules. So you can tell that this is an eosinophil, but it has these chunky basophilic granules. And that's a helpful clue that you're dealing with inversion 16. And then KMT2A rearranged AML, in adults is usually a monoplastic leukemia with very high white blood cells, um, whereas in children, it can actually be megakaryocytic. So that's you know one caveat that I want to point out to you is that even though in, in adults, it's usually monoplastic, in pediatrics, it may be megakaryocytic. And remember, as I told you before, KMT2A is very promiscuous. It can have different partner genes. And in fact, the most common is with MLLT3. This is considered an intermediate risk AML, whereas all other partners are considered to be adverse risk by ELN classification. And then if you see an AML that has a lot of basophils, you want to think of translocation 69 or DEC, DEC NUP214 uh, fusion. All right. And then let's get some of the to some of the more new stuff. You've all heard about, you know, the, the uh, relevance and the hype about menin inhibitors in acute myeloid leukemia. This is something that, you know, one of our colleagues here, Dr. Isa, Dr. Gus Isa is leading uh, a lot of the trials here. Very, very exciting therapy for patients with AML. And, you know, um, AML patients that are amenable to this type of targeted therapy are those with NPM1, those with KMT2A rearrangement, those with NEP98 rearrangement. And I can tell you that this is a large proportion of AMLs. If you think about NPM1 alone, NPM1 is 50% of diploid karyotype AML and 30% of all AML. So if you're able to tell just NPM1 alone by morphology and pick it up, you're doing a very good job, right? Okay, so let's see if we can do this. NPM1 has barely characteristic morphology and immunophenotype. 
So these, you know, you hear about these cup-like blasts. And the reason, you know, I just put a cup here for comparison, it's really this invagination in the nuclear uh, contour that gives you a cup-like shape. This is not absolutely specific. You see this in FLT3 ITD as well. But, you know, I think this morphology combined with an amino phenotype that's either monocytic or APL-like with, you know, the CD34 negative, HLA-DR negative blast is a very, very good indication that you're dealing with NPM1. And then we have an IHC for NPM1 that makes our job very, very easy. I do an NPM1 IHC on all of my uh, newly diagnosed AMLs. And the, the way to interpret this is, so NPM1 is ubiquitously expressed in every cell in the body, but it's nuclear. So you're not supposed to see cytoplasmic staining. When you have a mutation, the mechanism actually by which the mutation works is it displaces the NPM1 protein into the cytoplasm. So if you see cytoplasmic and nuclear staining together, that tells you that there's, there's, a, there's a mutation there. Very, very, very rarely, you can have a translocation of NPM1 that will give you the same pattern of staining. But in the context of AML, the most common scenario is mutation. How about NUP98? Uh, so NUP98, you know, it's it's a little bit newer on our radar. Again, we care about it now very much because of the menin inhibitor uh, therapies. But just to give you a little bit of a, a background, it's located on the short arm of chromosome 11. Uh, the rearrangements are, they're not common. They're only about 4% of pediatric and like 2, 2 to 3% of adult AML. You see commonly monocytic differentiation in these uh, in these and they are cytogenetically cryptic. What does that mean? It means that you can't see it on a karyotype. So you have to either fish for it or you have to use RNA sequencing or optical genome mapping. So a more high resolution method to detect this. But a clue that you're dealing with NEP98 rearrangement is if you look at, you know, if you see a diploid karyotype AML that has a FLT3 ITD and a WT1 mutation together, it's either NUP90, you know, so, so this is not specific, but you want to suspect either NUP98 rearrangement or the more newly described UVTF tandem duplications. Those also tend to have uh, concurrent FLT3 ITD and WT1s, and they have poor prognosis. So here's an example that we saw in our practice. This is, again, a monoblastic leukemia. You can see the cells have very monoblastic morphology, deep basophilic cytoplasm, the vacuoles. This case was positive for a FLT3 ITD and a WT1 mutation. Here, you can actually see that there is a 611 translocation, but you can't really identify the gene that's involved. So here we did optical genome mapping, and sure enough, it com confirms that the 611 translocation is between NSD1 and NUP98. And this was a relapse leukemia, so this, pa this, this patient was uh, eligible to receive uh, menin inhibitor therapy. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about AML with mutated TP53, another very important category in the WHO and ICC, uh, mostly because of you know, its adverse prognosis. Uh, the, the genetic classification of AML with TP53 is a little bit controversial. Uh, the, the ICC and ELN recognize AML with TP53 mutated uh, mutation as a distinct entity. But in the WHO, most of these cases fall into myelodysplasia-related AML due to their complex karyotype, okay? Now, one of the things that's very important in MDS now is the allelic status of TP53, meaning how many copies of TP53 are altered. There's a little bit, you know, there was a little bit of controversy about the importance of the allelic state of TP53 in AML, but I think there, there's more literature that's actually indicating that the allelic state of TP53 and AML is also important. So how do we determine the allelic state? You know, this is, I think, one of the practical uh, points that I want to I wanna discuss with you is, so if you have more than one, so remember, TP53 is a tumor suppressor gene, right? In order to have the catastrophic, you know, failure of the TP53 pathway, you really need to lose both copies, right? Okay. So if you have more than one mutation, it's a good indication that you know the two different alleles are probably uh, mutated. Of course, we're not doing single cell sequencing, so we can't tell this by certainty, but just based on biology, we can say that when there are two mutations, it's probably in two different alleles. If you have one mutation and you see deletion of the other copy, which is deletion of 17P, either by karyotype or by fish, again, you lost both copies, You know, you lost function of both copies, and then if you see one mutation with a variant allele frequency of more than 
it's probably a good indication that the other copy is also inactive because there's copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. And what that means is that the normal copy is deleted and the mutant copy is duplicated. So your only representation is from the mutant copy. We use, again, you know, similar to NPM1, we do uh, P53 IHC on all of our newly diagnosed AML because our clinical colleagues you know, are very cognizant of the TP53 status when they want to uh, enroll patients on different trials. And how do we interpret this? So, you know, this is on the left-hand side up here is the normal pattern of TP53 or of P53 expression. You'll see a few cells that are weakly to moderately positive. So this is normal. You'll see this in any, any you know, type of tissue. And then the abnormal pattern, the most frequent abnormal pattern is this very bright nuclear expression. And the reason you see this is that P53, so normal P53 is very rapidly degraded by MDM2. Mutant TP53 P53 is uh, resistant to MDM2 degradation, and so it accumulates in the, in the nuclei, and you see this very bright stain. That's abnormal. Uh, another abnormal pattern, if you, if you see complete loss of TP53, so here, if you look at the mononuclear cells, they're all negative. There's a few positive, weakly positive spindle cells. These are the endothelial cells, so that's your normal control, but everything else is dead negative. That's also an abnormal pattern, usually correlates with nonsense or truncating mutations. And this here is a caveat that, you know, I, I like to uh, highlight is, especially for pathologists that look at bone marrows, is if you have mutations and signaling pathways, you'll see some upregulation of P53, but it's not to the extent that you see in the mutant cases. So be aware of this pattern. And one other thing and one other caveat is that this protein expression pattern is agnostic of the allelic state. So we can tell you there's a mutation, but we can't tell if it's biallelic or monoallelic. All right, and just, you know, I told you about the prognosis of P53 mutations, but here's a, you know, more recent study really highlighting the, the prognostic significance of bi biallelic TP53 in AML and showing, you know, patients with single hit had an overall survival of eight months, whereas the double hit patients had an overall survival of one month. But you know, P, you know, we talk about TP53 being an awful prognostic indicator, but you know, it it the context is relevant, right? So if you see TP53 in the context of myelodysplasia-related AML, therapy-related AML, MDS, AML with KMT2, these are very bad, right? But then sometimes, very rarely, you see TP53 aberrations happen in what otherwise is thought of as a favorable risk AML, like a RUNCS1, RUNCS1T1, does it have the same prognostic implication or not is actually you know, controversial. So it's, it's you know, which clone is gonna win? But oftentimes the, the, you know, the rule of oncology is that when you have something very bad, that's usually the clone that's gonna prevail. So here's an example of, a, of such a case. This is a case that I had in practice actually a couple of months ago, a few months ago maybe. You know, this is a newly diagnosed AML. You can see the blasts have these cup-like, you know, uh, morphology that I talked to you about. I was looking at these cells. And I said, you know, this is going to be an NPM1 mutated AML. I can tell from the cup-like. And I did an NPM1 and a P53 IHC, just like I do on every newly diagnosed AML here. So you can see from, you know, what we discussed before, that the pattern of staining is cytoplasmic and nuclear. So that tells me that there's a mutation here. I look at this slide and I say, okay, great. This patient has an NPM1 mutated AML. And then the next slide I put on the, the microscope is this P53, and this clearly looks abnormal. So I thought to myself, this can't be right. Let me look at the patient name. Is, is it NPM1 and P53? Or, you know, did I pick up the wrong slide? Uh, but no, sure enough, it's the same. And you can see, in fact, I, I photographed the exact same area you can see from this, this vessel in the picture. So this really is you know, a barren expression of P53 with NPM1 mutation. And sure enough, there was a TP53 mutation with an 89% variant delay frequency in this case, together with an NPM1 mutation. And uh, if you look at the class of the current classification, both the WHO and ICC, NPM1 supersedes P53. So this is still considered an NPM1 mutated AML. However, both systems, as well as the ELM, acknowledge that the presence of a TP53 mutation may indicate adverse outcomes. So this patient may not do as well as just an NPM1 mutated case.
Another category in TP53 mutated AMLs is pure erythroid leukemia. Uh, is you know that the terminology of 2016. We've now gone back to calling these acute erythroid leukemias, and this is when you have more than 80% erythroid differentiation and more than 30% immature erythroblasts. The ICC does not recognize these as a distinct entity. They fall into AML with TP53 mutation category because virtually these are defined by the presence of TP53 mutation. Whereas the WHO recognizes them as a distinct category. And the reason for that really being that, you know, there is good literature to support that even in the context of AML, when you have erythroid or megakaryocytic differentiation, these leukemias tend to be resistant to venetoclax or BCL2 inhibitors because they rely on the BCL cell pathway. And so that's important. And you know, this is I just this is a picture of Dr. Bennett, who is the founder of the FAB classification. And you know, I just thought I would give him a shout out and say that, you know, don't discount morphology just because we have fancy genetics. That the morphology still matters, right? Even in the context of TP53 mutation, erythroid differentiation still matters. So, you know, don't give up on morphology just yet. All right, so let's look at another case example. This is a 59-year-old man with borderline cytopenia since 2023 with a right arm uh, subcutaneous nodule uh, that was biopsied a couple of months later. It showed an atypical lymphohistiocytic infiltrate that was reported in the clinical report. We had not seen that. The patient got a bone marrow biopsy that showed a hypercellular bone marrow with trilineal hematopoiesis and mild dysmegakaryopoiesis, and they did a repeat bone marrow at MEAs. So here's the bone marrow. You can actually see on lower power, this bone marrow has two very distinct looking areas. On the left-hand side, and these are high power images of the left-hand side, it looks like there are large cells that are forming sheets. On this side, it looks a little bit more normal. I mean, it's, it's not completely normal, but you see granulocytic maturation, you see some erythroid islands. So it looks very distinct. But look at, look at this on higher power. These cells have very convoluted nuclei they look like monocytes, right? They have a monocytic morphology and you can easily see mitotic figures. Here's one I'm pointing out, here's another one, here's another one. So very mitotically active too. Okay, here's the bone marrow aspirate. You see these very abnormal, atypical looking monocytes and there's some background dysplasia. Uh, we did flow cytometry. The flow cytometry detected about 0.35% aberrant CD34 positive cells. So myeloid progenitors, and then obviously, you, you know, these monocytes are so morphologically abnormal that I'm not surprised that they were immunophenotypically apparent as well. So we did an NGS. The NGS showed an ASXL1, SRSF2, PTPN11, IDH1, and Sybil mutations, right? Okay. So if we stopped here and trusted the NGS mutation, you know, mutation results alone, that would be the end of this case. However, Again, going back to the importance of morphology, you know, we look at this case and there looks like a monoblastic leukemia is evolving from something else. So the, this was a case that was evaluated by my colleague, Dr. Wei Wong, who very uh, astutely and smartly did an NPM1 IHC stain on this. And you can see, so I'm, you know, I'm showing you the, the, these two different areas. This one is, is the normal pattern of expression. You see that you know, there's a lot of space around the cells, which tells you that the staining is only in the nucleus. Whereas here, you can see that there's no space around the cells and the, 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 the cytoplasm is also staining. So the NPM1 mutation is only in this area and not in this area, right? So that's very important because when we did the aspirate, it's very likely that we aspirated this area of the bone marrow and didn't aspirate this area. So even though this is an NPM1 mutated AML, we were unable to show this on NGS. But in retrospect, when we went back and looked at the, the NGS reads manually, we actually see a very tiny mutated clone that confirms that this is actually an NPM1 mutated case. But you know, again, to tell you the importance of morphology and putting the whole picture together. So if we just send this patient's bone marrow without looking the, at the morphology for NGS, we would have missed this diagnosis. Here's another example of a false negative NGS. So this is a patient, this was a case of mine uh, that I looked at. This patient had a history of a TP53 mutated MDS and had you know, suspected relapse based on their uh, dropping count. They did a bone marrow and uh, the NGS was negative for mutations. 
But I'll show you pictures of the bone marrow. So if you look at the bone marrow, the bone marrow has a hypercellular and a hypocellular region, right? It's very, there's you know a big contrast in the cellularity of these different regions. If I do a CD34 and a P53 stain, so these are just high power images of the same areas, it's actually the lower cellularity area that has these immature looking cells. And there's a concentration of CD34 positive blasts that's very patchy. So there's almost none of them here and a lot of them here. And same with P53. So the, the overexpression is very much limited to this focus with the CD34 positive cells. And this is for sure a mutant pattern. So again, you know, having seen this picture, we, I, we went back and looked at the NGS reads manually. And sure enough, the patient's historic TP53 mutation is there in like five reads, but it's way below the limit of detection that the assay would, would actually call, the pipeline would call. So again, another, you know, another shout out to morphology and why we shouldn't do ancillary testing in isolation. Another example, this is a 79-year-old man that presented to the ED with nausea, vomiting, and unintentional weight loss. Uh, he had uh, profound anemia, some leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. His family history really was not significant. He has three adult children that are healthy and without hematologic malignancies, and he underwent a bone marrow examination. This is his bone marrow, and you know I think this is morphologically very consistent and diagnostic for MDS. It's a hypercellular bone marrow. You see these small megakaryocytes. These are dysplastic. So, you know, so far with the patient's cytopenias, with this morphology, we can say, okay, there's MBS here, right? And let's look at the morphology. Again, the very small hypolobated megakaryocytes, the hypogranular granulocytes here, this erythroid uh, uh, precursor with cytoplasmic uh, basophilic stippling. So very good for MBS. The karyotype comes back. It's obviously a complex karyotype. This is a composite karyotype with many abnormalities, but I wanna draw your attention to the presence of a uh, derivative 517, which really, this means that the, uh, the long arm of chromosome five is lost in this translocation. So it's an unbalanced translocation, right? And there's also loss of 17P. So there's deletion of 5Q and deletion of 17P in addition to the other abnormalities here. If I look at the next generation sequencing reads, here we see a TP53 mutation, not surprising because you know we also saw the 17P uh, loss at a variant allele frequency of 70%. And there's also a DDX41 mutation with a variant allele frequency of 14%. Now, you know, for those of you that are familiar with the germline inherited um, bone marrow, uh, uh, sorry, uh, inherited um, myeloid neoplasms, so DDX41 is one of the predisposing mutations to myeloid neoplasms. And this D140 frame shift, oh, sorry, D140 frame shift mutation is actually one of the most common germline pathogenic mutations in this context. Okay, so hold that thought, but he, look here, the variant allele frequency is only 14%, which is very unusual for a germline mutation. You would expect a germline mutation to have a variant allele frequency of around 50%. Okay, so again, I did a P53 IHC, and this is very much consistent with the presence of a P53 mutation. And we talked about you know, the, the multi-hit status. Again, if we go back to the allelic frequency here, the variant allele frequency is 70%. So if we follow this diagram of ours, you know, there, there is copy neutral loss of, uh, I'm sorry, there is deletion of 17. And so that's why you see the high variant allele frequency because there's only representation of the, uh, the mutant allele. Um, so that's, you know, consistent with a biallelic hit. But, you know, what's going on with the DDX41 mutation? Why is it only at 14%? Is this germline or somatic? So again, I told you, we know the, the D140FS frame shift mutation is the, mon the most common germline variants, right? And again, I told you that we don't have a germline control in our routine myeloid panel. So I can't tell you with certainty whether this is germline or somatic. The variant allele frequency tells me that this may be somatic, but knowing, you know, having knowledge of the literature and of this type of mutation, I'm highly suspicious that this is, this is a germline mutation, right? Okay. So remember, germline DDX41 mutations are usually frameshift or nonsense. They're loss of function. And again, these are the two most common mutations. 
Whereas the somatic mutations, and you know, these patients that develop the, the DDX41 related uh, myeloid neoplasms, they typically have two hits in DDX41. So they have their germ germline and then they have an acquired somatic mutation, which is usually missense. It affects the ATP binding domain. And in this scenario, the ARC 525H is the most common mutation. So again, just to remind you of the distribution of these uh, somatic and germline mutations, the yellow ones and the uh, green ones here are germline, the top ones are the, the um, somatics, and the length of the lollipop correlates with the frequency of the mutation. Here's the R140, uh, you can see it's one of the most common germline mutations. So let's, you know, let's think through this. How, what are we dealing with here? So there's a few scenarios. Uh, we postulated that the subheterozygous VAF may be attribu attributable to some of these scenarios. Is it possible that in this patient, this is a somatic mutation? I mean, I think we should entertain that, that idea. Uh, is it possible that it's a mosaic germline variant, meaning it's only, it's only present in certain cells, but it's not in all of cells, but it is still inherited in germline? The other uh, possibility is that there's a mutation in the primer binding site of the gene, where, you know, where we bind our primers to do the PCR. If there's a mutation there, the primer is not going to bind well, and so you won't have adequate coverage in this region, and your VAF will artificially drop, or that there's copy number loss of the chromosome that is harboring this variant, right? Because I showed you that there was a deletion of chromosome 5, and remember, DDX41 is located on chromosome 5Q. So this patient was sent for genetic testing. They got a skin biopsy. And then NGS performed on cultured fibroblasts of the skin, which, you know, is not hematopoietic in origin, confirmed that this mutation was there at a heterozygous fat at about 50%, suggesting that the site, so remember, let's go back to the karyotype here. Uh, I showed you that there's a deletion of 5Q, right? So in this patient, uh, in contrast to what is normally the pathogenesis of DDX41-related neoplasms, I think what happened is that the locus of five that actually had the mutant DDX41, the germline mutation was deleted, right? So then you get subheterozygous representation in your NGS, and this patient's disease is actually driven by the TP53 mutation, not, not by the germline DDX41, right? So in this case, even though the patient has a DDX41 mutation, it's not really the pathogenesis or the driver of the disease. But why do we care about that? Why is it important? It's important because, first of all, you know, this has genetic implications. You want to get the patient genetic counseling. You want to test other family members. It's important for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because, you know, it would be catastrophic to take a related family member and transplant the patient with a bone marrow that has the same pathogenic mutation, obviously. So you want to know that. But also it has treatment implications. Because, you know, we, we, there are studies by us and others where we've shown that these DDX41 mutated neoplasms respond really nicely to the metal class based therapies. But then, you know, in the case of this patient, this is really a TP53 mutated neoplasm that's been driving, that's being driven by TP53. And in contrast to DDX41, TP53 mutated neoplasms actually are resistant to venetoclax-based therapies and HMA-based therapies. So this patient will probably, you know, not respond ideally to venetoclax. And um, I think I'll end with that. And, you know, I hope that from this, you know, presentation, what you took away was that pathology is not easy. It's actually complex, but there is a method to the madness. I think you can, you know, it's like solving a puzzle. I really love what I do every day. I come to work and I just feel like a glorified, um, you know, uh, personal detective or PI. So it's really nice. I think, you know, you just have to think through the cases, put everything together, make a story and, you know, hopefully give the patient the best diagnosis. Um, and, you know, contact your hematopathologist if there are any questions, um, email them, call them and, you know, get in touch with them. And hopefully you can get your patient the best diagnosis and the best therapy. And I will be happy to take questions. All right, so I see some questions in the chat. Uh, okay, so someone asks, in your center, uh, you make aspiration and biopsy systematically or according to pathology? So we always prefer to get both uh, if we can. Uh, and, you know, I think they try to get both, but there are some, uh, you know, some instances, let's say follow-up for MDS, we may only get an aspirate. 
Uh, but for a new diagnosis, we always, if possible, get both aspiration and biopsy. Uh, yes, so someone commented on uh, the uh, TREF on biopsy before the aspirate, and I agree, and that's why most, you know, most places do the aspiration before the biopsy. Uh, but, you know, that was just a morphology comment. Uh, okay, so how do you, someone asked, how do you discern blasts from monocytes on a peripheral blood smear? Um, so, you know, monocytic, so monocytes can also be blasts, right? Pro-monocytes and pro-monoblasts are, are considered blasts, but it's essentially just a morphologic distinction. Uh, it's not 100% reliable, uh, but I think, you know, if you see enough of these cells, you're pretty much able to tell monocytes from just myeloblasts. Monocytes tend to have more cytoplasm, uh, more uh, pale blue cytoplasm, they're vacuolated, their nuclei are indented. Um, and then someone comments, I really always found it difficult initially in training to recognize erythroid precursors as not being glass. I was always taught to recognize red cell precursors as chocolate chip-like cells, uh, but the explanation of elongated nuclei touching a membrane was helpful, all right? Um, in which cases do you do NGS? So I think, you know, we're, we're kind of spoiled and very lucky here. We pretty much do NGS on all of our suspected myeloid neoplasms. So almost every patient that gets a bone marrow gets, gets an NGS for a suspected myeloid neoplasm. Uh, what is the sample volume at your center to achieve those TATs? Oh, a lot. So we do normally, uh, you know, we're a very big center with a lot of resources. So I, I don't want to like take this out of context, but um, our... Bone marrow volume is somewhere between 60 to 100 bone marrows a day. And then with cytometry, do you still need cytochemistry for AML diagnosis? We still do cytochemistry. We do MPO on all of our uh, newly diagnosed AMLs just because it's rapid, it's cheap. Um, you know, I don't think you absolutely need to do cytochemistry on AML if you're doing a full uh, flow panel, but we find it helpful just because we're able to, you know, see that. The cytochemical stain takes about an hour to do, and that's you know way before the flow is out. So we're just able to give a usually give a diagnosis based on that. Uh, do you use e catherin for acute erythroid leukemia? Yes, I do. I find it helpful. Remember, e catherin just tells you that the erythroids are immature. It doesn't tell you that. So even if you have normal left shifted erythroids, they will be positive for e catherin. Uh, but it is helpful. So if I'm trying to just determine whether something is erythroid in lineage and it looks immature, e catherin is helpful. Uh, and then for your patient with low NPM1 VAF, one cannot imagine a preexistent CML, CMML seen monocytic dysplastic. Yeah, I think this patient did have a preexisting CMML that acquired an NPM1 mutation. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, but I think that's essentially what happened. Uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, best sample for NGS, is it peripheral blood or bone marrow? I think it depends on the indication uh, that, you know, if you're looking, if, if the, the diagnosis is MDS, you're suspecting MDS, peripheral blood is just as good. Uh, if let's say you're dealing with, like I said, like an NPM1 mutated AML where you don't have circulating blasts, uh, peripheral blood is not as helpful. So it's really about representation of the, the cellular compartment in the bone marrow. If you're dealing with a stem cell neoplasm like MDS where everything is mutated, then peripheral blood is fine. But if, you, if you're looking for something that's only present in the blast and the blasts are not in the peripheral blood, then that's not helpful. Uh, what's your review of FANC? So that's a FANCONI mutation on NGS AML, but BA is negative. Sorry, I don't think I understand the question. Uh, how do we distinguish somatic from germline mutations? So, you know, to do this definitively and reliably, you need a germline tissue that's unaffected by the disease that you're looking for. But again, I think, as I told you, when we don't have a germline control, we rely on very allele frequency, what's reported in the literature, the, um, you know, the context of, of uh, the bone marrow. So it's really a multimodal approach. It's not 100%, but the best way to do it is to test germline tissue that's not affected by disease. Um, is abnormal localization of immature precursors only seen in myelodysplastic processes? No, I think you can see abnormal localization of immature precursors in any myeloid diaphragm. It's just not, not just MDS. And then how do you deal with hematogones? Um, 
so I'm not sure specifically what they're asking, but I think maybe uh, like how do we identify hematoglons from uh, lymphoid glass? You know, we rely heavily on uh, flow cytometry. Uh, so similar to my lymph progenitors, lymphoblasts also have a very tightly regulated pattern of uh, so hematoglons have a very tightly regulated pattern of antigen expression. So we use that to tell normal from abnormal. Um, and then what volume of syringe is preferred for aspiration? So the more, the better. Uh, but, you know, we what we normally get is six milliliters. And then um, do you perform PAS for uh, ALL? So not routinely. Uh, we don't perform PAS for ALL. I, I occasionally do PAS if I'm suspecting an acute erythroid leukemia, but not routinely. Uh, and then can CD117 be positive in lymphoblastic leukemia? Uh, it depends on the type of lymphoblastic. VALL, much less common, has CD117. It can rarely have it, but TALL can actually express CD117, particularly ETP, early T, T, early T precursor. Um, and I think I got all the questions. Oh, sorry, there's one more question. Um, thank you. Uh, they, uh, and then they said, please, can I ask if you would consider any blasts in the skin in the context of CMML, AML defining, especially to... So th th this is actually a very good question. No, any blast in the skin is not... A so remember, CMML can involve the skin very frequently, and there's a spectrum of skin. You know, there's a very nice paper... Um, I believe the first author is Dr. Vite, uh, and they go over the spectrum of uh, manifestation of the cutaneous manifestations of CMML. So you can have something in the skin that looks like CMML. You can have something that looks like blasted plasmocytic dendritic cells. You can have uh, BPD or mature plasmocytic dendritic cells. But to to call something myeloid sarcoma, uh, you want to see sheets of blasts. And by blasts, I mean actual myeloid blasts or monocytic blasts, right? So you can't look mature uh, because you can't just have involvement by CMML. Uh, and then what is the least molecular one should do for TALL and ETP? So we run the same panel. Uh, as you know, the most common mutations in ETP overlap with myeloid mutations as well. So you get, you know, FLT3, WT1, but we run the same panel as we do on the myeloids. And then MDS with glass and AML with glass on bone marrow biopsy, um, how do I identify and differentiate? So right now, if you look at the classification, uh, a lot of these genetic abnormalities are AML defining regardless of glass count. So the glass count is not as important anymore. Uh, but you know, if you have a if, if you don't have the genetic abnormalities that are AML defining, and if you're really relying on the blast count for uh, the distinction between AML and MDS, if you have a good aspirate smear, I always count on the aspirate. I don't look at the bone marrow biopsy. You know, I don't base my count on the bone marrow biopsy. But if the aspirate is poor, or if I see some patchy area that looks like it's you know sheets of blast on the biopsy that I'm not seeing on the aspirate, then I obviously do a same. Typically, MDS blasts are CD34 positive, but you know you want to be mindful that sometimes blasts can be CD34 negative, so I would do a CD117 as well. I think I got them all. All right. Thank you, everybody.